When was it I spoke to you in class? Was it October time? October, November? Um, I think it was October. Yeah, October. Yeah, because I remember then you, you kind of said you had an idea for the second record. Is that still the kind of idea you're going off of for? What did I, did I say the idea? You didn't say the idea, you just said you had the idea for it and you thought that was going to be the what you were going to make. But I don't know what it was. <laughs> <laughs> actually, I actually don't remember. <laughs> but but the idea that we have, the idea that I had is, is um, I've been having it for a while, yeah. It's really much like the way I feel about artists today. I don't know, I just feel like we need to make a record as a band that has a purpose and has a call, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I mean, I saw you put a post up on Instagram, was it like a few days back, kind of speaking about a lot of stuff that kind of really resonated with me and the way the industry has kind of shifted and just the way the world shifted really and what we're kind of focused on now. And it's maybe not for the better a lot of the time when it comes to technology and stuff. Yeah, you know what, like I've... I've my quarantine was weird because, like, it started in April, right? Or, like, March, I don't remember. But I worked, like, a lot making beats every day. And then I realized everyone kind of, like, went on a break except me. And I got mad for a bit, um, as in actually mad. I was like, okay. I don't know, the fact that everyone wasn't working as much as before was, like, really affecting me. So I kind of lost it. And then I decided to, to, have, like, to have a long break. I took a long break um, in the south of Italy for like two weeks. And for the first time ever, I didn't think about music. Like I was for- forcing myself to not think about music or work. I found myself writing really long notes about life and, and things that I like think. It was kind of like writing a sort of realization down, if you know what I mean. Yeah, it was, ca- it was like a monologue, really. Yeah, and one, one of those papers that I wrote down was that thing I posted, but um, the Dusky Loops record is also about kind of that. I mean, it's going to be a record about innocence in the way, in the way, like, I want it to be a very child childlike record, but also like a record about very honest, innocent emotions, because I feel like we're living in a world where everything is accepted now, and and I can't really see honesty anymore in a way i don't know at least i feel like that i feel like people think that honesty is just taking a picture on instagram with your phone but it's not the way i see it if you know what i mean yeah i mean if you're doing that it's very kind of cultivated isn't it it's kind of cultivating an image and cultivating a style as opposed to actually being a real kind of experience and something truthful yeah exactly i don't know like i feel like you know after i took this break i realized all these things and it's it's really hitting me I've been thinking about it a lot about more like the world that is around me because I think like you know I, I tend to just concentrate on my music and don't think about anything else so it's easy to get lost in what you do but then when you stop you actually realize wow there's so much going on and a lot of it is actually more confusing than what I thought it can be quite jarring as well though like if, when you do suddenly stop and then you suddenly look at everything and you're like what the fuck's happened because everything changes so quickly now as well like if you don't stop for six months, like obviously, you, you know, you've been turning the record and stuff and then you look back, I imagine quite a lot had shifted in terms of the way we are as people. Yeah. I mean, it's really strange, actually. Um, I mean, not, not, be, not being able to, to even like touch people without thinking that you're going to get ill is, is weird, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's pretty dystopian. <laughs> yeah, it's strange. When you took that two weeks off, what kind of stuff were you doing? Were you just like, kind of experiencing and indulging like in the the culture and the the scenery and stuff or what were you getting up to well i was um in in the south here in italy um in a region called puglia and just just like fields and sea there so i was literally just trying to be for once because i tend to just as i said just concentrate on my music all the time and never really stop and it's actually quite hard to take breaks for me so this time i would i just left without laptop i had my phone only like you know for emergency reasons or whatever and yeah I, would, I just like thought all the time i was just thinking and just like eating and looking at the water <laughs> all of that kind of thing was it was it like tough when you when you first did that and you first stopped because i know like if i stopped doing something you kind of you get depressed for a couple of days and then once you kind of get through that it can kind of be quite nice to take a, a week or a couple of weeks off yeah 100 percent. i mean i actually got depression before like, when I said I got a bit mad, that's kind of what I meant. Like, I got, like, very down in the middle of the lockdown. So the break was actually, like, it felt really good. But usually when I stop, even, like, I, I, even like after a tour, I do get quite 
down anyway because I'm stopping, which is a really strange concept, right? Like you should be, you should feel good when you take a break. But in my case, I get anxious and stuff. I'm like, why? You know, I don't want it to be like that, but <laughs> that's just the way it is with me. Maybe, maybe part of it comes from the fact though that when you know when you're on tour, there's so much adrenaline and you're constantly having like these crazy experiences, and then suddenly it's back to like normal life, and it again it can be a bit jarring and a bit of a shock to the system. Suddenly having to stop and just slow down completely, it can be a bit uncomfortable. Yeah, I think that I think that's part of it. I I also think there's probably like a side of me that doesn't really want to think about anything else. You know, like I feel like living living in your dream which is essentially what i'm doing because I, I feel really lucky that i'm doing music all the time it's it's so good that you actually kind of don't want to deal with the rest do you know what i mean sometimes it can really feel like you're living in your own cloud when did you when did you start like just loving music all the time when did you go full time and you were just constantly doing everything at what point did you start doing that we started like doing enough money with the band to kind of like not think about anything else two or three years ago or maybe two years ago um, like we still have to work and things like we're not that rich but we have enough money to just survive off what we do for us groups if you know what I mean like everything is always paid by ourselves in the band like we are like self sufficient like that we don't need to ask for money or we don't need to put money ourselves that was a very confusing way of saying it um, <laughs> like we, we always have enough to carry on if you know what I mean and as a producer I just make money on my own so yeah i mean i don't often have to go out and do different things which i'm i feel really lucky for yeah are you still um i remember again last time we spoke you were kind of starting to get a bit interested in fashion as well is that something that's kind of still progressing you still getting into that or yeah i'm actually i'm actually doing that a lot here because i feel like because i took a break from music for a bit um i was actually thinking a lot about fashion during that time um yeah i mean i just love making clothes i call it fashion but I also sound very pretentious, I think, when I call it fashion, because I know, I know nothing about fashion yet. But I just feel like very good about making clothes. What sort of stuff? Have, so did you did you design the jumpsuit? Cause remember you had the Husky Loops jumpsuit on. Yeah, I mean, I'm really into the the having like writings on clothes. I really like the idea of, of printing meaningful sentences on clothes, but like in a good way like you know they need to be good designed not just like random i don't like the punk aesthetic as much i like it when it's very like um tidy and, and clean well you can kind of make a pattern out of really interesting phrases can't you like when you kind of mesh that with style and design yeah i also i got really into shades recently as well i'm I'm trying to i'm getting a friend of mine to help me to like design my own sunglasses where did you get because you were wearing a pair on stage i remember like one half of it was like black and the other half was white and they were just sick yeah I mean, those are Gucci. Gucci, man. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, yeah, for a band at our stage, that was outrageous. Like, but why not? Yeah, they were nice shades, to be fair. But Gucci, man. Whew. I know. It set you back a wee bit. But I feel like, I feel like, you know, in the indie world, if you wear Gucci, you, like, everyone looks at you like you're, you're crazy or like you probably like Kanye West too much or or you're rich, but I'm like, but you, all of you have laptops and probably went to private schools anyway. What's the difference? Do you know what I mean? Like, I just like spending money for classes, you know? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, everyone's got things that they want to spend money on, and you find that a lot of people probably just waste money on stupid shit, whereas why not buy something that you enjoy, even if it is quite expensive, and, you know, you're going to wear quite a lot. Yeah, I agree with that, exactly. I mean, I just really like good design. Um, I think because I, I grew up in a family, uh, you know, my, my mom was an architect and an interior designer and my dad was a director and a photographer and then uh, went into marketing. But he uh, was always really into design. I think I just started, I mean, I learned how to appreciate good design and, and, and just clothes and furniture and all that and, and, and good books. Books in the sense of like, you know, the impagination of it, like the way it's like being printed and things, like the, the graphic design behind it. So I think that's why I enjoy it. Yeah, I mean, I guess there's a lot of parallels between books and design and stuff as well, because the way that every sentence is so like carefully structured and every word is so like precisely chosen, it's insane. Like the level of kind of construction that goes into putting a book together and writing one. Yeah, exactly. I mean, P- Pietro actually does that. That's like his job. You know, he's a, he's a he's a like proper professional graphic designer. Is there a connection doing between like fashion and music? Then I mean, if you look at Kanye as well, you know, someone who's really into his fashion. In the sense that they're both kind of they're both designing things, aren't they? They're both constructing things, and they're both very meticulous. 
I mean, I think I think there, uh, there's always been a, a really strong connection between fashion and and music. I think mean, like modern music is extremely. It's it's a fine line sometimes between the persona and and the music in pop, right? So fashion just helps to underline that. I feel like there's a connection. I think there's a strong connection because like your clothes and the way you move on stage with those clothes can really like change the perception of who you are and sometimes even the music. Like I don't think we would feel the same about Blondie if she didn't have that haircut and wearing those t-shirts. And the same way we wouldn't feel the same about Kanye if probably if he didn't make the Yeezys and start wearing tight trousers and all of that. Yeah, I mean, it's almost like building a brand. Yeah, and that's what I'm really into. I mean, that's why also, like, obviously I'm not like a big marketing guy and I, I don't really like love the, the way marketing people think, but I'm never really against marketing because I actually love branding myself. Like, the Husky Loops for me really started as a brand. Obviously music comes first, always, but I love the idea of our band being a brand. If the brand comes from like a place of creativity, there's nothing wrong with it. If you're using it in a creative manner and kind of using it to extend outward from the music, you know, it's perfectly, it becomes like part of the, part of the, uh, the creation and the process. Exactly, exactly. And I, I just love, I love thinking of, of, of our personality and how we can initiate that and how can, we can like, you know, make that really strong. It ties into like your live show as well, like with the whole design thing you've got going on behind you. You know, when you've got that kind of display that you brought on tour with you. Yeah, all of it. Like, all of it should be, you know, well thought. That's what we want to do. And I feel like if we had more money, we'd do, like... We have enough ideas to, like, make a very great arena show. We just need more fans and more money. <laughs> <laughs> but but also, like, you know, I think it's important to find ideas that suit where you are in life. Actually, those are the best ideas. Like, the ideas that you have... The ideas that you can, like, pursue with the tools you have are always going to be the best. Yeah. Like you mentioned like arena shows then like having those ideas. Do you have like a vision? Have you got it kinda of mapped that in your head? Do you have ideas for each level of the progression of you know what I mean in terms of a band getting bigger in size? I do. I mean I tend to always think about the future and I think that's probably my problem. I very struggle to feel the present. I'm always like ahead. And and as I said, like I would love to be more that guy that finds great ideas for the present rather than the future. Because I'm always thinking ahead. Like even the artwork of our first album, I can't even speak English. I think, like, I love that. I think it's great. I mean, I'm not scared of saying how proud I am of it. But at the same time, you know, I can't help but thinking maybe if, I'd, if I held that back for a bit, maybe it would have been bigger, like, in two or three years. You know what I mean? But I always think that with my ideas. I feel like I, I, I'm too ahead. Like, I'd, I'd rather be sometimes a little bit more where I'm at right now. I guess as well, though, like, if you'd held that cover back two or three years, somebody might have come up with it in that time like it's a very unique idea and you don't want to let it slip away from you well that's yeah that's <laughs> that's something i think about often i don't want people to do what i do but but I, I mean i don't know i guess i guess you're right but also i feel like if you feel like that over time then probably you're gonna think more with your ego rather than like with your again like innocent mind and i try to be as innocent as i can you know what i mean i feel that's a key to any good artist um, at least that's my opinion like you really need to be innocent and honest and direct as much as you can I feel like if I if I feel like I'm gonna put an idea out because someone else might do it after me I feel that's already like kind of poisoning the idea a bit yeah because it yeah because I guess it then becomes kind of part of that yeah I guess you're comparing yourself to other people when you start doing that which isn't something you maybe want to do as a creative you're thinking about other people and it's kind of yeah getting in the way of the real idea. Yeah. I mean, and don't get me wrong, I definitely think that all the time. I'm actually, every time an album comes out that I really connect to, I'm always thinking like, oh shit, I should have done that before, you know? I'm like super competitive and I think that all the time, but I tend, I try not to think like that, you know, I try to be a better person. <laughs> Do you think it's part of what drives you as well though, that kind of competitive spirit? Yeah. What else would you say drives you? I mean, generally, usually the idea of, is, of inspiring people really drives me like to be for another guy were like pet sounds or the white stripes or like a tribe called quest were for me that would mean a lot i feel that would be enough of a reason to make records because those records changed my life and i feel like you know they made me want to change other people not in an arrogant way not like i want to be the one that changes the world but 
I feel like if I got something to give, it has to be very meaningful. Like it has to be that level of of meaningfulness. And I think also like what drives me is probably like um being from Italy and knowing that there's not many Italian people that know that did what I want to do, which is you know kind of getting worldwide um recognition again. It's very easy to sound super mega arrogant when you say stuff like that, but can when I, when I mean when I say world recognition is more like I want to make universal music or like my idea of what feels universal. You know what I mean? Because I feel like a lot of Italian records are very, even the ones I really really deeply love. I think they kind of stay where they were made, but the music I want to make, I want to make it like very like, you know, for the for the world. Yeah, I mean, there's something incredibly powerful about an idea from one region of the world resonating with everyone all over the place. Like if someone comes up with an idea in, look at the Beatles, for example, like, look, someone comes up with an idea in Liverpool, but that resonates, you know, thousands of miles away in America and Japan. It's everywhere. Like it's, it's not confined by where it came from and it becomes more powerful as a result. Yeah, exactly. That's a really good example. And again, I think that is what drives me. Like I feel like being from Italy, but being from the North and, and now living in London, you know, I've never really felt like I'm part of something. I've never really felt like I'm part of a group or a movement. I'm not really, like, I'm not, like, from a community where, like, there's music like hip-hop or folk, if you talk if you talk about, like, Ireland or Scotland or whatever. So, like, I feel like what drives me is to really find my own thing. And that's probably why I'm so obsessed with making original records and with the idea of, like, having my own sound and the Husky Loop sound and, and you know, because I really want to find, like, my place in the world. I felt I feel like if I felt, like, part of a movement, I probably wouldn't think exactly like that. But in my case, I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm basically from a place where music in that way, in the way I want to make it, doesn't really exist. So everything I can do is just create my own sound and hopefully people will relate to it. Yeah, it's almost like as well that you don't have... Like, if you look at, like, say, like a scene in Scotland, for instance like the the punks and whatever they're all looking at the punk bands that have come before them and trying to kind of emulate emulate that to a certain degree whereas you're not doing that you don't have anyone to follow so you end up coming up with something kind of quite different and it's not it's not imitating anything it's just trying to be its own thing yeah i feel that way 100 percent. and i think i feel lucky about my situation because i also feel like that's why i can and i want to make everything you know that was actually like I I still think that's an issue, especially with Vasco Loops, the fact that we change sound so much and style so much. But the reason why we do that is not because we don't care about making money, but it's because we all feel like you know we don't belong to a certain type of 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 scene or music, so we can actually do whatever we feel like. You know what I mean? Like I feel like I can belong to anything because I don't belong from a specific place. You know what I mean? That's what makes people interested in you as well, because when you look at a band like you know the 1975 for instance that don't have a particular style and kind of mash things up a lot you kind of you you stay in one genre and you gain a heap of fans then you move to another genre and some of those fans stay with you and then you gain a heap of new fans from that genre and it kind of keeps progressing and keeps building kind of gathers momentum yeah exactly i mean i really appreciate how they change yeah they take a lot of risks yeah i think they do they're doing the right move but you know like if if you were like dj premier you know if you had that kind of sound and if you were like from a black community and making hip hop and and that's your calling in life and that's your passion. I think it would probably be stranger for him. Maybe I'm wrong. I, mean, I actually hope I'm wrong, but I think it would be stranger for him to make, you know, a Led Zeppelin record. You know what I mean? Or like something that doesn't come from his place. Well, because I'm not, I don't have anything like that behind me. I feel like when I listen to DJ Premier, I can really connect to it, and when I listen to Led Zeppelin, I can really connect to it. Does that does make sense? Yeah, and I think it. Do you think it ties into as well what you were saying earlier about always looking forward? You're not like tied to your past in any way, whereas maybe some of those yeah people are to a certain degree. Yeah, or those artists. Sorry. Yeah, I think that's true. When you know when you were, you were speaking earlier about wanting to make records that kind of inspired other people, or, or making music that inspires other people, like the way that Pet Sounds did for you. Do you see that happening directly in the studio? Like when you're working with an art, another artist, if you have an idea that then sparks something with them, is that the kind of is that the kind of feeling? Is that a similar feeling, do you think? Or Yeah, I think it is. I mean, the way I write for myself, is it's obviously different from the way I work with people, um, like with other artists, but I feel my goals are kind of the same. So when I, when I write a song, I'm obviously more in control of what I'm writing lyrically and, and melodically. 
So I, I try to be as honest as I can. And my goal is to make something that someone can listen to and relate to it and, and get inspired from it. And when I'm working with an artist, you know, I, I kind of want honesty from them. And I produce the, the record in a way that can be inspiring, I think. I mean, at least, like, that's what I try to do as much as I can. I don't, I don't really like to get into the... You know, the worst thing that can happen in the studio with me is when someone says, oh, well, this sounds a bit too strange. We should make it sound like that. You know what I mean? And I'm like, why? Like, I get if you don't want your record to sound strange because it's totally cool to be pop. And I love pop. But if you're in a creative process and, and your goal is to really put yourself in the music so people can hear where you are, why would you want to sound like something else? Yeah, I mean, as long as it sounds good, you want it to sound interesting and different. Like what you were saying earlier about taking risks, that's kind of part of what makes things exciting to listen to, is the sense that someone is doing, is taking a risk with it. Yeah, but especially if I'm working with another artist, what I want to hear, and I think what people will want to hear, is themselves. You know what I mean? Like, a, a, they don't want to hear, like, a copy of him doing someone else. They want to hear him or her. No, they want to hear the artist, you know what I mean? And that's actually the hardest part. And that's why I'm, I'm, I'm getting so obsessed with the concept of, of honesty and truth and innocence and, and rawness because it's actually really hard to, to be that kind of person. And I feel like today we are completely losing it. Today is really normal to go in the studio and, and a lot of rappers and or even like writers would just spend all the time in the studio looking at their phones on Instagram, scrolling. And then they would also say shit like that. Like, yeah, you want to sound like that guy. I'm like, oh. I don't know, like, to me, it should be more about giving everything you have to be yourself, because if you do that in a record, people will hear that you did that, and they will connect to you instantly, you know what I mean? Like, if I, if you think, like, about John Lennon, because you were talking about the Beatles, that's really what he was doing. Like, his solo records, to me, are so powerful, because you can hear how honest he was. I mean, sometimes to a degree as well, well he, he wasn't afraid to speak about things that he maybe didn't want to speak about and were kind of darker subjects, if you know what I mean, and darker aspects of his personality. Yeah. When everything has like a cultivated image, people are almost afraid to accept the fact that maybe there are parts of themselves that they don't like and they don't want to share with people, but it could be quite cathartic to share that with people and liberating to do so. I agree. I mean, that's actually another interesting concept. I used to do that for a while. I used to have this book and write everything down. Things that, like, I would feel uncomfortable with writing with myself. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, it would be, it would, it would feel weird to write it down by myself and I thought like I used to feel that's actually the most interesting stuff to put in songs because if you put filters that's never gonna be good enough you know what I mean like people don't deserve that I feel like people deserve honesty and truth even in art and in fact I feel the best pop artists are the ones that are honest with their popiness like every time you talk to labels and there's like this major label kind of discussion and they and you decide beforehand what you're gonna do in terms of like lyrics and and emotions like when you pre-plan an emotion that's not gonna work yeah because it's not natural it's not organic exactly and, and people want i think people want organic stuff still today like i don't think we, i don't think we lost that yet like i think i at least personally want something natural and organic or the feels natural and organic you know and i i, I like the personality of people like the same way we're talking now and I'm, you know, I'm enjoying talking to you. Like I would, you know, I would like to hear this side of you in a record. I wouldn't like to hear, you know, Joshua Tree number two. <laughs> I don't know why I thought about Joshua Tree, but. <laughs> no, yeah, I completely get what you mean. I mean, you do, you know, we're speaking about darker stuff there and addressing aspects of your personality. You're like speaking about writing stuff down, but you do that in, um couple of your songs about like love you wrong like that's kind of addressing like the slightly darker side of love and a slightly obsessive kind of lusting slight element of it that you don't really hear in a lot of like mainstream pop music yeah i mean actually that i wrote that next to a girl it was really strange <laughs> <laughs> she was she was she was sleeping and i just thought this is not the way of doing things and i just wrote it all down but yeah that's a good example I mean, in fact i think that's my favorite song yeah just because it's so honest yeah because it's like the most honest thing an interesting thing I've written so far, I think, in terms of of emotions. Yeah, I mean, you've got that line in it. Um, oh, what is it like? I want to wake you up and touch you better. Like that's just—it's such a raw line. Like that really, like it stands out, you know. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm glad you like it. it. Like a lot, most music, you know, a lot of music is honest, but 
it's honest about certain things like there are still things that people don't want to talk about in music and aspects of themselves that you know you, you don't seem afraid to kind of touch but do you think it, does it put you more in touch with like kind of maybe slightly darker aspects of your personality and does it force you to confront them when you write about them well i mean i think we all we'll all, ha- we all we all have that right we all we all have dark sides so i feel like if you can afford then you're lucky enough to put them down on paper why not there's a way of like fighting them i guess if you want to fight them it's probably a healthier way of dealing with them yeah and i guess like if you get success out of it and you realize a lot of people connected that it's actually the best way of healing them because you realize that you're not alone like in fact i'm like that's why i'm really happy you like that song and every every time someone tells me they love love you wrong the, the, the concept of it i get really like happy because i'm like okay wow so you know what i feel about love in that way isn't just something i feel yeah, it's just, it's another aspect of it. There can be an affectionate side to it and there can be a slightly obsessive side to it. Same thing with music and love of music. There are times when it can be obsessive and there are times can it be, when it can be wonderfully joyous. Yeah, I mean, in my case, it can definitely be obsessive. <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to, I mean, we were speaking, you know, there, that kind of ties into like Song Confessional as well. You know, the thing you did with them with uh, Who Did You Call? Like that, again, that's a slightly, it's a very confessional song about a really dark kind of topic. Oh uh, yeah, did you listen, did you listen to that podcast? Yeah, I've I've listened to it a few times. It's a fucked up story, man. Like it's fucked. Like <laughs> I was thinking in the studio, of course we get the most fucked up story, bro. Like of course, as Clips is getting that. It was so strange. How did that work? Like, did you have to? Were you did you stop and pass me your tour in America? Or how does that work? That project? Yeah, we were in Austin and we we had to record. We wanted to record a song for the album with Jim, which is the only song I haven't fully engineer and produce which um was a little a little something we were doing that with jim um jim is the drummer of spoon and he's a great producer and engineer and he's got this sick studio in austin and when we got there he he asked us like hey do you want to be part of this thing that we're doing it's called song confessional blah 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 and we said yeah great let's do the song today because the 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 theme was already set on doing a song in a day like i think every artist or bands recorded their songs and put in the songs in one day so we we brought we were jamming and we brought what did you call i mean the guys were jamming in the live room and i was writing the lyrics but i had to like you know take inspiration from the confession of this guy killing cats and stuff um yeah it was crazy but it was all very natural and very cool um it was actually a very cool process yeah i mean did, so you wrote it from the perspective of the guy that turned him into the fbi well i mean i i couldn't really connect to that because as I said, like in the interview in the podcast, um, I'm not American, obviously, so I can't really connect with this idea of like calling the FBI on people, and I also generally wouldn't do that. Um, I, you know, I probably would call a doctor or whatever. So I, w- I was kind of more connecting on the idea of a friend betraying you. Yeah, and I guess if you do that, you can apply it to your own life, and you can kind of then you kind of then like what we were saying earlier then you you then add your own personality and your own honesty into it even if it is being told through the guise of, of someone else's story yeah i, I mean it, yeah, it was actually very close to love you wrong in a way as you said because you know i i guess i was writing a song about not being about what it's not normal in a relationship with a friend where well, love you wrong was about how you can love someone in a wrong way because yeah that's the side that was connected to i guess but it's really interesting to listen, you know, to a story like that and still feel connected to it because it's got nothing to do with you. Like obviously, I'm not American. I'm not killing cats. I haven't called the FBI on a friend of mine, but still, like, you can connect to it. That's strange, right? That's quite cool. Yeah, it's interesting how you can get that other. It's kind of similar to the way music connects with people, though. You know, it's like you apply your own meaning when you listen to someone else's song, and that's why a record like. Again, you mentioned the Beach Boys earlier. That connects with you because you kind of put your own meaning on it and apply it to the context of your own life. One hundred percent. I mean, in the case of Bed Sounds, actually, you know, the, that record just blew my mind for the production. I mean, I guess the reason why I'm a producer today is because of the album. I don't think I would even be thinking about production if it wasn't for Bed Sounds. It really changed my entire life. Like I, I should tattoo it on my chest. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's a. Uh... So did you get that when? Would that record kind of blow you away the first time you listened to it? I'm glad you asked because, like everything I love, it took me at least three or four times. Like every, all my favorite records, I hated at the beginning. I hated, like did not get it. 
And I feel like when you find something so shocking that you actually don't get it the first time, with me at least, the second or the third time when I do get it, it's going to change my life. And it's the same with girls. Like, like all the girls I fell in love with, like, really had, like, long, really meaningful relationships and really loved them. I didn't think that the first time I saw them. Like, I didn't really have something, like, thunderstruck. I was more like, oh, yeah, it's just, like, this person. And it's actually a bit strange. I don't know how I feel about it. And then a week gone by and I'm completely in love. And it's the same with pet sounds or elephant or the white strap is another, like, milestone of mine. I mean, that's such a fascinating record, Elephant, to bring up, because it's so... You can maybe hear that a bit more in your earlier stuff, but it's so stripped back, but just works so well. It's just a, a few elements, you know, kind of minimalist, done to such a high degree, and there's such a power that comes from that record. It's genius. It's just genius. Uh, have you got the vinyl? Or the CD? Have you got like, the physical version of it? No, I've, I've got Pet Sounds. I've not got the White Stripes Elephant. So if you buy Elephant in vinyl, or I think all CD, um, there's like a letter that Jack Wright wrote about... Um, the death of the little heart, which is not too far away from the kind of concept that I want to base the new Ask Loops album on. You know, that's kind of what I mean by innocence. Because innocence, I think in English as well, can mean a lot of different things. The kind of innocence that's been talked about in Elephant is kind of what I want to make the album about. Because no one knows that Elephant is essentially a concept album. And like, if you, if you hear, when, when you realize that and you hear it again, you really hear the genius of the album. It's like super raw hard hitting garagey rock music but full of meaning and that's not common like you know i can't think of another band that sounds so heavy but it's so emotional like maybe like some emo stuff which i don't i don't particularly care about emo like that maybe some emo hardcore bands do that but with like stooges kind of music to have feelings in the way jack right jack white has them to me is like a first it's genius the album is genius yeah do you think so obviously you know you were saying there about how like i didn't know about that concept behind the record but it still really resonates with me do you think that meaning kind of comes out in a subconscious level when someone listens to it without realizing that do you think it still hits in some manner even if you don't know about that i think it does and i also think like like everything that comes out at a certain time it will resonate with the people of the time if you think about it the album came out in 2003 that's kind of when we had the first internet revolution you know what i mean like everyone started using internet and bands and pop was really overly produced and then we got to that indie big new wave in england and and i think we got also new hip-hop that was weirder with the years and now i think we're in that part again like now we are so on the internet and everything is so overly produced so something like elephant would be very helpful i think in the world in the world right now do you think there is a movement at the minute that's kind of spread on you you're speaking there about the indie boom and that rock record coming out right at the turn of the century is there a movement at the minute that you feel has that same kind of power and that same interest about it or is interesting for you i mean i don't think there is any movement today is there (laughs) which is actually kind of cool i mean maybe you can tell me i don't know I i don't i haven't really heard of like an actual scene especially for bands in like years sometimes they talk about the south london scene but that's not really a scene that's just like three bands yeah yeah i mean i think people like to think they're in a scene when maybe it's not really if you know what i mean i think i think people like to label things yeah i mean i don't think i don't think there's particularly yeah i don't think there's particularly any movement today um which is really typical of the era we're living in and i'm cool with that actually i like the fact that everyone can find their own individuality like i'm not against individualism but i do think like in the same way in the early 2000s the internet started coming out and everyone got like to a certain level of an awareness and change now that's happening again but we're also comfortable with the internet so in a way like it's even more alienating and yeah like i want the ask loops album to be kind of like elephant i want it to be raw and very like i want pe- i want people to think you know yeah it would be interesting to apply that concept to the kind of stuff you do though like where you mash so many genres together to try and deliver that in quite a raw manner it would be quite a, an interesting thing yeah i mean i i think the ask album this time around will be very raw also because i'm i've been working so much with different artists which is something i didn't used to do as much like two or three years ago so i actually feel like the need of of doing that with the band 
and as as I said, especially as a band, like I think we we need to give people honesty. You know, like there is nothing worse for the way I see it that there are that are very like overly produced band that makes pop music. Because like, what's the point? In two thousand and twenty, I don't really get the point of a band doing that. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. But yeah, I mean, I'm trying to think of an example of someone who's been successful doing it, but. I guess it kind of comes back to the core of that. There is always like really, you know, superb songwriting or fascinating honesty at its heart. You can't really get away with it. Just I mean, I can think of many examples of bands that are, are doing overproduced pop stuff, but I don't want to diss them on the podcast, so I won't say it. <laughs> <laughs> when did, so do you think this new record, Inko, will use more or less computer on it? I think way less. I mean, the only, I, I, as I, I always say that, and, and I always sound like, just saying that because I want to be cool, but I actually mean it. Like, if I had the budget, I probably would just work on tape with a band. Well, I would still edit stuff a lot and do changes and, and, you know, like, mix a lot of the stuff and changing the sounds and really, like, get into the sonics of the sounds, but I wouldn't do it with a laptop. Like, I feel like with, with us loops, like, the least amount of screens you see, the better it is. Well, if I'm working on a hip-hop record, I, I just think the laptop is actually the best way of doing it i guess as well if you're working on a hip-hop stuff it can kind of scratch that itch that creative itch to you know kind of use that side of your your skills and then you can kind of go back to husk lips and it's maybe a bit more liberating because you can kind of just do anything because you don't have the desire to kind of you know yeah that's definitely a side that's definitely true and and hip-hop is also more honest i think in general as a genre it's it's more direct than rock like maybe rock used to be like this in the 50s, but now, like, with all the history that we had, and at least as free as people that, like, we've been playing it for years and we've been playing our instruments for years, it's never going to be as direct. Like, with hip-hop, is the thing I love about it the most. Like, I'm in a room with someone else, I'm making the beat, the guy gets really turned on by it and really inspired, writes the lyrics down in that moment, raps it, and that's it, that's the record. You know what I mean? It's It's great. But with the band... You don't get that kind of like instant honesty like that. So you kind of need to like leave all of the dishonest, you know, distractions out of the room. So no phones, no laptops. Otherwise, you would just end up like making a kind of rocky sounding record. And I think that's not, you know, if you talk about rock and roll, I want you to be a bro and, and honest. Wait, so are you, are you like no phones in the studio? Like they're completely out the door. They're not, they're not get past. I, there's, there's like a documentary little thing that we shot in the studio on our Instagram and you can see how annoyed I am every time someone films me <laughs> <laughs> like I hate with the band I hate that especially also because they're my friends and, and I've known them for years like the fact that they're, they're filming me it just turns me mad I fucking hate it but again there is something about rap where if you're just like using your phone it's not as bad I don't know why but like when I'm playing instruments I mean, and I'm with the guys I don't want phones around. I guess it's just another distract, like another distraction that you wouldn't take a book into the studio, would you? I wouldn't know. I mean, I to me, studio is literally at like churches. Like to me, being in a studio is like a, a sacred thing. I'm like, this is religion, and I want to focus as much as I can. And I don't like wasting time either. Like, it's okay if you like had a day where you didn't feel like doing things, but to be in the studio, muck around, I I just hate that. So anything that can distract you isn't really great. What's your uh, what's your studio set up like now? Have you got your own studio down in London? We literally just um, lost the place because of the pandemic, but we we had it until a month ago. Yeah, <laughs> we gotta look for something else. But yeah, we are lucky enough, as I said, to have like enough to have our own place. Yeah, See, we, you know, we're speaking about computers a wee bit back. When did you first start using them? Was that kind of spool? Was that when you first kind of brought them into Husky Loops type of stuff? Yeah, wow, correct. Yeah, that's good knowledge. Yeah. What 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 motivated that move on to computers? What motivated me? To, yeah, to shift. Because I, I remember before you were very kind of against them. What motivated the shift to start using them? Um, Hip hop, I think. Like I was making beats over time and working. And that's the period where I started working with other people as well. I realized I was, I don't know, I didn't like the fact that I was using all these cool ideas only with other people. So I started bringing them more in the band because it just gave me the opportunity of experimenting more with the sound of the band. And I'm glad I've done it because now that I've done that and also I've done that with the album, now I can actually go back to what I always seen as Calypso, which is not computer based. The kind of like tempo type stuff. Yeah, even 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 before that, even like before we released anything, just I just kind of wanted to be 100% live and raw because I feel like we have the experience now. So, you know, in a way, 
after you learn to use something, you don't need to use it again to, to do the same thing. You can just like use the experience and transport it into something else. Yeah, I, I guess in the same way that music is kind of a, you know, people always speak about music being a snapshot in time. It's kind of a snapshot of all your experiences that have also happened before and kind of everything that's led up to this point, if you know what I mean. Yeah, exactly. And you can always like, you know, let's say you spent one year of your life like we did repeating literally the same riff over and over again and listening to it on the computer over and over again. I feel like now, next time we're going to go to a studio, even if you record on tape and there's literally no computers there, we will probably just start jamming and do that because it's what we're used to now. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I guess when you did, um, was it the tiny factory jams you did? That probably kind of helps that. You know, when you did that, what was it like five and a half hours you just improvised for or something? Yeah, that's crazy, actually, that project. <laughs> that, that was like, that was done actually four years ago i think and that was a while back but yeah it was cool where about did you do that in our old studio in bethel and green it was like a junkies place it was terrible that's why they sound like that it's like it was a weird place <laughs> how did that like that process work so it was just like five so you just have like a rotating like kind of cast of people coming in you did five and a half hours of just straight up completely improvised stuff yeah it, it was like friends and musicians i really like would come in and I would literally just click record and tell them, play. So all of that is 100%, literally 100% improvised. And it ended up being 5 hours and 30 minutes. I mean, I never really thought it, sh- it should be 5 hours and 30 minutes, but the other day, you know, I wanted to release something for the pandemic, and I thought, oh, wow, I got all of those jams I've never done anything with. You know, I was like, wow, it's 5 hours and 30 minutes. If there is, like, any time... That you probably like listen to five hours and forty minutes of music. It's probably right now because you've got nothing to do, and you're stuck inside. So that's how it came about. There's some cool shit in there though. Like there's just parts where it's really interesting when it just suddenly changes and suddenly it's this really cool thing. Like some of the guitar parts and stuff on that, like just really sick riffs and stuff. Did you ever do anything with the the ideas you came up with, or have they just do they just exist on that recording? So me and Carrie once sampled one of those jams and we made the tune, but it never uh, it never came out. Actually, no, it became it became something else. It became a track called "Freaking and Bowling" in the in the last album that she dropped. Was that the the mixtape that came out back in April? April, yeah. Yeah. How did you? Because you you went over to LA and met her. How did that kind of? What do you remember about the first time you met her? Let's speak about the album. It's a good record. I I loved her straight away. Like I she again talking about fashion she was wearing these really cool clothes shit like her personality was spot on like when she walked into the room i was like i know exactly who you are i know what you want to do just by looking at you and then when she started talking to me she started saying like oh you know i want to kind of experiment with live music i I would like to do some rocky stuff i like guitars i'm getting into uk grime a bit and i was like you know girl i'm your guy like you're literally talking to who you need (laughs) And I kind of joked around and said, like, we're we going to make an album, like, as soon as you want. I'm going to do it all. And then I didn't make much of it. I thought, like, she probably would just think I'm insane, like a lot of people think. But instead, she texted me, like, three days later saying we're making an album. And she came to London. And we actually made an album that hasn't come out yet in a week. And then we we did, never released it. We worked on more stuff the second time I went to LA. And then she went... She came to London again in January and we made Loki Superstar in another week and then we released that first. But we have like at least 10 tracks more to to, to release. Man. I mean, when you were speaking there about, you know, when you first met her, you could tell everything about her straight away just from her kind of personality and when she was. That really shines through in the music as well. Like, there's so much charisma on that record. Just... Thank you. I'm glad you say that because she is like that. Like sometimes when she speaks, she's basically rapping and she would hate me saying that because she doesn't even like to be called a rapper. But like when she, when she said something cool, she sounds like she could rap it and it would sound as cool. Do you know what I mean? Like a lot of those songs were just literally made in the room with talking and, and she would say something cool and I would go, oh, that's a really cool concept. We should make a song about that. Or she would just like, you know, stick up for instance. She was pissed off for like, as someone, because this person like hoed money, and she was just started, she just started screaming, saying how angry she was, and I was like, we should make that into a song, and we did, and literally what you hear in the in stick up is her being angry, and everything she says in the lyrics is what she said to me that day. Fuck, that's probably why it's so raw though, and why it kind of just hits. Yeah, but that's why I love working with Carrie, because Carrie is like that. 
she's very honest. She's actually super upfront. Like, she, if she thinks something is shit, she's gonna tell you. You know what I mean? She's not gonna, like, say, oh, yeah, it's nice. She's gonna go, no, Daniel, this is shit. <laughs> I'm like, okay, well then, gonna do it again. Is that, like, the most important element to have in the process when you're collaborating with someone in that space and, and working on a song? I don't know. I couldn't say. I mean, I think it's different with each person. Like me and Twist, for example, which is the other girl I collaborate with a lot, um, we're never that honest. We're honest, but like we're never like we always we always experiment more. Like we would do something and then probably sit on it for two weeks and then try something else. But we carry it was always more like, do you like this? No. Do you like this? Yes. Okay. Then you you take that and move on. You know, she's always she's more direct in that way. But I know when when you're in the studio, you can get quite absorbed in it when you're working on it how do you communicate someone when you're in that kind of state how do you communicate with someone in the studio creatively it's like that's actually the hardest part of production and it's something that i don't think i mastered yet and i really like admire in great producers the way that you know to be a great producer you need to be a great human being you need to be able to connect with people and really get into their soul and make them feel comfortable and make them feel like they can be the best they can be you know what i mean yeah, I mean, I, I, that's the other part is the hardest part for me because I feel like I'm, I'm coming from an artist position. I've always been an artist, and I actually would like to become. If I'm ever gonna take a solo career, I would actually to become a kind of producer artist rather than like, just a singer. If you know what I'm saying. So when I when I produce other artists, I I I can, I, I don't know. Like I feel people want to work with me because of what I can add as well and, kind of like the sound I'm gonna give to them. Um, I've never really produced a record in the very classic sense of just like talking to the artist. I don't know if you've seen that like, um documentary about Dr. Dre and Jimmy Hayovine. No, I don't think I have. You should watch it. It's like it's basically like you know, Jimmy Hayovine and Dr. Dre have been collaborators for like thirty years. They made headphones beats together. They made like so much stuff. And Jimmy Hayovine was a producer in the seventies and he produced like huge records for like Bruce Springsteen and she did uh, Stevie Nicks and Patti Smith. And, and just the way he was producing people was amazing. It was basically just helping them out, being great. You know what I mean? It was that kind of production. It wasn't like musical as much. It was more like, to me, when I watched the documentary, I felt like you're just like supporting them and, and, and you're making them be great. And that's the hardest thing. And I don't think I got to that stage yet. Like, I feel like I need more work, you know? If someone just comes to me and says, hey, what do I need to do to be great? I wouldn't have the answers. I guess it's about trying to give them that platform, really, isn't it? And just give them that kind of leg up to get to, you know, a, a higher level of quality. And again, as you say, add your own kind of spin to it as well in that process. Yeah, you need to sit there and listen a lot and you need to be patient. Yeah, it's, it's, that's, it's, that's, I think that people don't realise how much hard work like that um, people put into records, you know? Like me, I, again, me and Carrie, seven days, we made the record. So when you say, like, you made it in seven days, everyone concentrates on the fact that you're being very quick. Right? It's also not that hard to be quick with laptops today, you know? It's it's easy. But the amount of stress and discussions and, like, arguments, or not necessarily arguments, more discussions and, like, words that we put into the record was huge. You know what I mean? Like, because we were producing it together. Like, I was the producer, but she would also have very clear ideas about what she wants and... and yeah, you know, you need to listen a lot and be patient and let people be. Yeah. Did you sleep in those seven days at all? Or did you just power through? I power through. That's kind of my mode. <laughs> yeah. But then I take a break for like two or three days later. Not really a break, but I sleep more. Yeah. Can I just recharge? Yeah. Sleep is important. Sleep is great. People don't, people don't get that. Sleeping is amazing. It's also annoying to a certain extent, though. Like if you just want to keep working on something, but you know you've got to sleep. It can be frustrating. I relate to that, yeah. Being a human sucks. <laughs> human needs are in the way, yeah. Do you ever forget to, like, eat and drink and stuff when you're in the studio? Yeah, it's common. Um, not drink, but eat sometimes, yeah. I mean, or I would, like, purposely skip lunch to just get more time. You know, it sounds very unhealthy, which probably is. It sounds like, you know, it's the wrong way to do it. But for me, that's actually the... Like, if, if I'm in that space, if I'm so concentrated, I'm doing my best stuff. Yeah, I mean, once you've got that momentum, you don't want to lose it by going to get lunch. Like, if you could go for lunch, like, a few hours later, and once that kind of, that, that spell of creativity is kind of slowed down a little bit, it makes sense to do that rather than just break, because that's the time you're supposed to break. Yeah, exactly. I agree with you. You know, you're speaking a lot about being in the studio and, and collaborating with people. 
by being by being more honest in your music does that then make you more honest in life and therefore a better producer does that is it kind of reciprocal in that way that's a very good question and i think the answer is yes yeah like every time i made a better song or every time i became in my opinion a bit better in terms of like you know i've learned from my mistakes or like i'm had an experience that changed me that also definitely becomes something that helps my production have you seen the last Tarantino movie? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know the little scene where the girl is talking to DiCaprio? Um, this is like that nine-year-old actress that she's really sassy and witty. And she says to, like, Rick Dalton, she says something like, as actors, we need to, like, you know, strive for perfection. And, of course, we never quite get there because it's impossible, but it's the pursuit that is meaningful. And I feel like it's exactly the same with music or production or anything you're doing. Like, it's the pursuit that matters, you know? Like, and when I'm in the studio, um, especially producing, like, I, you know, I'm, I'm trying to get pet sounds every time. Like, that's, as I said, like, before, like, or, or, or Elephant, or the records I love, you know? Like, the Low End 3 or Tropical Quest or Mad Villain, like, I'm trying to get there. Like, I'm trying to get to what I think. It's perfect. And even if I never do get it, the pursuit is what matters. And I feel like if I, if that's my mentality and if that's the amount of love I want to put in it, then it's probably going to be a, a great record. Yeah, I guess the pleasure comes from the thrill of the process. Yeah, like it really is true when people say to enjoy the journey. You know? And actually, I've learned that the hard way. Like I've made so many things not enjoying the journey and not thinking about the pursuit, but more kind of being obsessed about the result. And I'm not happy about that. And now I've learned that. And I think like that's also probably why I'm better than before. Because I know that you're living an experience and you should and, and, and that experience really matters. It's not just like something that you shouldn't think about because what matters is the just the result. Do you know what I mean? Like what you're living and and, and how you talk to people and again talking about honesty, how honest you are that day. That really matters. Yeah. Do you ever get closure from a song then? Are you able to get closure from a song? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I d- um, I don't know. I actually don't know how to answer that question, but it's a really good question. It's an inter- Yeah, it's an interesting thing to think about because I imagine there's always going to be part of you that wants to go back and work on it more to a certain degree. Or yeah, I mean, I, I guess when I- <laughs> when I say I don't know how to answer that question is because I probably would say that I would change everything I've done, but I don't want to say it. I don't want to admit it to myself because I don't want to be that crazy. But yeah, like yeah, I mean, I probably would change every single song I've done. Like if I had, if I was crazy enough and if I had the extra time, which I would never have again, I'd probably change everything, yeah. Do you have to set deadlines for yourself then and say, once once you've finished, you know, that, and like, like take the record, for example, I know you guys finished that like a year before it came out. Did you say to yourself, in 10 months time, we're going to, you know, we're going to put it out and we need to have it, that's when we're going to stop tinkering with it? I think more than deadlines, I, I, I tend to finish something when I feel when I don't have anything to add to it in that moment and I feel good about it. Like if I can play it to someone and I feel good about it and I don't have really anything to add, then it's probably finished. But then obviously, as you're asking me, in three months time, I could go back to it and go, wow, I would change that. But because I've decided that it's finished, I try to not be as crazy as I would like to be. But in the moment, I think there's, there's moments of closure, yeah. There's moments of, like, of me and myself going, hey, you know, there's actually nothing you can do more than that right now. And you should just let it go. 